Good afternoon, students. I can't believe we're already in week seven. And so today's uh, topic is going to be about business communication. And so I'm going to talk about how you can apply. Oh, good afternoon, Anil. So I'm going to talk about how you can apply um, the business communication, the five paragraph essay structure, and everything that we learn in this class, like the, the writing techniques and everything, to business communications. So, hey Lisa, how are you doing? So, uh, without further ado, because due to Zoom fatigue and all that stuff, I will, and this is going to be a pretty long, long lecture because I'm condensing uh, uh, two different classes of business communication, business writing, and business etiquette all into one uh, PowerPoint. So this, this will run a bit long, so here goes nothing. Here you go. And then, uh, um, so today's uh, lecture, we're going to talk about the building blocks of effective messages. We're going to talk about letters, memos, and email messages. We're going to talk about interpersonal communication, working in groups, working in other countries, business writing templates, proposals, in other words, how to write a prop business proposal, social media, and resume and job interview tips. Okay, and so here, these are the different kinds of business communication. You have business letters, business email, business memos, and business facts. And so when we use, when we write in business, um, first person, second person, third person case in writing, in academic research, in academic writing, we are doing research on a research topic such as abortion, gun control, or education. And so when we do academic writing, we use third person case, he, she, they. And so in academic writing, we avoid other cases like first person case you, um, I mean first person case I, and second person case you. In creative writing, we write poems, stories for books and movies. And that's when we use first person case, I, my, we, and us. In business writing, we are striving, we are writing at the workplace, such as emails, memos, business letters, and in business what writing, we avoid using first person case and primarily use you or your a lot. Okay, and so here you have, and so business versus academic writing, and I did this one already. So the significance of business communication. Business, business correspondence is an essential tool for the day-to-day -day operations of a company. It helps people within an organization communicate with each other efficiently. It also helps an organization transact and maintain good professional relationships. Um, if weather forecasts inform us of the current weather conditions and their development, business plans operate in the same way. It gives readers an idea of how the company should work in order to achieve its target. So it is important that we know how to communicate effectively, both in actual, both in actual and via email. Okay, that's not it. And so part of building a good image is taking the time to write correctly. Even organizations have adopted a casual dress code, still expecting, so that means when you write something, it should be free of errors, because you want to build good will. You also need to, to have biased free language. That means you don't say business man, you say business, uh, or business woman, you would just say uh, business person. So you always use more neutral alternatives when gender is not important to the idea you are getting at. For example, use chairperson instead of chairman, firefighter instead of fireman, um, salesperson instead of salesman. Guidelines for achieving bias-free communication. Be aware of words, images, and situations that suggest all or most members of a group are the same. Avoid qualifiers that reinforce stereotypes. Identify people by identity characteristics only when relevant. So here's some examples. Firemen becomes uh, f first responders. Mailmen become mail carrier. What would chairman become? Chairperson. chairperson. What about businessman? Same thing would be a business 
business person or uh, he or she can become they, miss or missus becomes ms, stewardess becomes what? A steward? Steward or flight attendant. Yeah, stewardess is the old way of saying, that's very 1960s. Um, what about waiter and waitress? Server. Server. Mankind becomes humanity. Uh, lots of men do the work. Lots of people do the work. So you get the idea that you just make it more uh, gender friendly. And here, instead of saying each student does his or her work, you would say each student does. Lisa, what would you what would you put there? Wouldn't be his or her. How what pronoun could we use so that it's gender free? Their work, yes. Each student does their work. Every man, woman, and child are on their own. That sort of, that sort of thing. So that, that's, that's how you would um, make it gender free. When possible, write in the plural. So here they give you the answer. Um, each student would meet with their professor. Uh, each alumni was invited. Write in the second person. In most cases, it is acceptable and preferable to address readers in the se second person means you and your. So this creates writing that is less legalistic. And so instead of saying this applicant should submit his resume by November 1st, you would write instead submit your resume by November 1st. Okay? So in other words, you're telling the reader it's um, you're telling the reader a declarative sentence. In other words, you're giving the, the reader an order. Okay, and so you're talking directly to, to the reader, and that way it sounds more, uh, and avoid using his or her, avoid slash constructions. So um, this I already did. So what are the benefits of good communication skills? Why does bad writing waste time? Lisa, what, what are the benefits of good communication skills? I'm trying to get an undone. Benefit of good communication skills. Well, I mean, it makes you not sound like you're uneducated, but. Uh, yeah, I actually had a student from Oklahoma who said, I want to thank you, Professor H, for teaching me how to write so that people don't realize I speak with an Oklahoma accent. That's what he said. Um, yeah, so do you have good writing skills that would impress your boss? What are some examples of bias-free language? Uh, Anil. You got the idea. Yeah, and the firemen, instead of that, go into first responder, stewardess, flight attendant. So you're not generalizing just by gender. OK, so I guess everybody already knows that. What are the seven C's of business communication? And so the seven C's of business communication is you need to be clear. Make sure your focus is on one central idea in your message. Make sure your body paragraphs, just like this is a five paragraph essay structure and you thought it was just for this class. Make sure all your body paragraphs relate to this main idea, which is your thesis statement. And if you have coherence in your message, your message is clear. The second uh, C or the seven C's of is to be concise. Focus on that one idea. All details all have to support that idea. Keep it short to avoid misunderstandings. Keep it short because your boss does not have time to read a book at work. And get rid of filler words like, by the way. The, the, third, um, the third C of communication is concrete. When your message is concrete, then your audience has a clear picture of what you're telling them. There are details, but not too many, and vivid facts. And there's laser-like focus. Your message is solid, so it's concrete. The fourth one is correct. Make sure your message has no grammar or punctuation errors to maintain a professional image of your company. Too many errors projects an unprofessional image of your company. When your communication is correct, it fits your audience. And correct communication is also error-free. Do the technical terms you, you use fit your audience's level of education or knowledge? 
So in other words, if you're talking in front of a lot of beginners, you may have to define what you're going to say, all the technical terms. If you're talking in front of a lot of experts, if you define everything, you'll bore them silly. So you have to keep track of your audience. Are all names and titles spelled correctly? The next one, coherent. When your communication is coherent, it's logical. All points are connected and relevant to the main topic. The tone and the flow of the text is consistent. So a lot of these C's overlap with each other. Complete. In a complete message, the audience has everything they need to be informed. And if applicable, take action. And this is how business writing differs from academic writing. In academic writing, you, you just want to inform, persuade, or entertain the reader. The reader doesn't have to necessarily take action. But in business writing, you want, to, you want the reader to take action. You want the reader to go out and buy your product, do business with you, or hire you. So that's, how, that's, that's what differentiates um, business writing from academic writing. Or creative writing is you want the reader to, to feel, be emotive, uh, experience what you experience. And so different purposes of writing require different kinds of writing. So does your message in your business writing include a call to action so that your audience clearly knows what you want them to do? Have you included all relevant information, contact names, date, times, locations, and so on? The next C is courteous. This, I think this is the last C. This is the seventh C of courteous communication is friendly, open, and honest. There are no hidden insults or passive-aggressive tones. You keep your reader's viewpoint in mind, and you're empathetic to their needs. Part of being courteous is using bias-free language to make the work environment feel more inclusive for everyone in the office. And so here, so what are the seven C's of communications? Anybody can name them? What are the seven C's of communications? Of communication. So clear, concise, concrete. Uh, correct, coherent, complete, and courteous. Yeah, clear, concise, concrete, correct, coherent, complete, courteous. And in my other business class, the rubric used to look like this. In other words, um, 10 points if something was clear, another 10 points if something was concise, another 10 points if something was concrete, that sort of thing. That was how every single like um, business writing assignment was uh, scored Is when I, when I was teaching my other um, class. All right, so different kinds of purpose of writing. So types of business communication and their purpose. Instructional, informational, persuasive, and transactional. Instructional is very similar to, say, technical, uh, write, technical writing, in which you're telling someone how to do something. Informational means that you're informing someone of the status of your report or, or your job or your company, what your company does. Persuasive is the most familiar one. You watch any TV ad and you're trying to persuade that person to buy something from you or hire you. Transactional means that you guys are, it's an invoice. You're buying something from someone, you're trading services. I do this for so much for that, that sort of thing. So those are the types of business communications that you have. And so here you would have instructional. The instructional is more like te technical writing where you have a tr tra training manual and it's like, a, it's like when you first get a job and then the, the company gives you a, a, a manual filled with rules about the company. So that's instructional. Um, and then informational writing, keeping accurate business records which tracks the core functions of a business, outlining future plans, complying with legal obligations, the minutes of a meeting is an example of, an in, of informational business writing. Persuasive. The goal of persuasive writing, which is what we're going to do in week nine, in the week nine forum, is to convince the reader to buy a product or do business with that company. Such writing is generally associated with marketing and sales. This includes business proposals, bulk sale emails, and press releases. Transactional. Day-to-day -day communication at the workplace falls under transactional business. The bulk of such communication is by email, which also includes official letters, forms, and invoices. Beware of your audience. And so here you have different generations at the workplace. 
you're going to have the oldest generation will be the baby boomers and the youngest generation nowadays is not no longer millennials now the youngest generation i think is generation z or something like that it used to be millennials were the youngest all right and so and it used to be the world war ii generation as the oldest so now, now, now baby boomers are the oldest. So baby boomers born between 1946 to 1964. So why is this important? Different generations have different ways of communications. So baby boomers tended to have been born before the internet. So baby boomers are, if you want to communicate with a baby boomer, you would want to communicate with them with a the telephone or face to face. Baby boomers really like to be more hands-on. And so when I had a boss who was a baby boomer, I remember we all went to these face-to-face -face meetings. Even when I was teaching online, I had to drive over to the school in order to have the face-to-face -face meetings. And then as my bosses got younger and younger, pretty, pretty much in, in, instead of traveling to face-to-face -to -face meetings, we started to do Zoom or Skype because younger generations prefer more social media. So if you're going to do business with a baby boomer, you would want to hold meetings. You would want to, to do the telephone, email. And, then, and also baby boomers like Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And baby boomers do not like younger people who, who think that they know so much technology and you treat the, the baby boomer like some kind of dinosaur. Hey, look, Grandpa, this is how you, you know, you use the, 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 the computer as if assuming that because he's a baby boomer, he doesn't know how to use a computer. But it is true that baby boomers prefer more face time than the next, than the next generation. Generation X is someone from 1965 to 1980. And so Generation X is similar to the baby boomers, but we're starting to switch in to more social media. So Generation X is very flexible. So they can actually, they're, they're comfortable with either social media uh, or telephone or face-to-face. -face. In other words, Generation X has to learn to, to, uh, to be like the older generation because they're almost the same age and also like the younger generation because they're almost the same age. It's like the sandwich generation. So when you deal with a Generation Xer, it's okay to use Facebook, social media. You can talk with them, television, um, and social media I just I just said that so and and have all these different kinds of meetings so that's generation X they are they are, they are often uh, middle middle man managers and they are hardworking individualistic committed to change and seeking life balance Millennials generation Y so this is the generation that was raised on the internet and so therefore if you're going to deal with a millennial they love their email Okay, they're not so crazy about face to face um, when they can just email you the message. They're not so crazy about telephone because they can email you the message. So for the millennials uh, born 1981 to 1996, it's digital all the way. They prefer to interact through text, text, instant messaging, and social media, especially Facebook. Now, if you're going to deal with a baby boomer, they're not so crazy about texting. So this is all about business communication throughout different generations. That's the reason why I'm introducing this, so that if you have a, a boss that's millennial, okay, you're going to text, email, and Zoom them. And then if you have a boss that's a baby boomer, then you would telephone that person and or, and or make an appointment to meet face-to-face -face somewhere. So this is how you would impress someone from all of these different generations. That's the only reason why I bring, bring it up is that different generations, depending on when you were brought up, how comfortable they are with software. As we get younger, okay, from baby boomer, uh, generation X, and now we're getting down, I think, to the youngest generation, generation Z is known as the homeland generation. In other words, people born between 1997 to 2010. Now, these people like their telephones, unlike the previous generations who like the social media, internet, and as you go up, it, telephone and face-to-face. -face. I just went up old. Now, Generation Z, they love their social apps and their telephone and streaming and, and, and different, different devices, not just, not just only social media and not just only your computer and Zoom, which is boring to Generation Z. Generation Z has to have three different devices sitting in front of them and each different device has a different TV program or has a different program or a game in front of them 
And Generation Z likes to play those 3D games, like, um, I can't remember the name of the game, but you have an avatar, and then you can uh, interact with other avatars, uh, versions of you. You can even have a life, uh, metaverse, yeah, a life on, on, online. So that's what Generation Z is even more, even more um, into the internet than uh, the millennials. And also Generation Z is a, what they call a digital native. They were born with a cell phone in their hand. And for baby boomers, we were born with a television. Can you imagine a house with no television set or radio? For a baby boomer, wouldn't that be way too quiet if, if you were to live someplace with no television permanently? I'm not talking about a vacation or a weekend, okay? But for Generation Z, the same can be said about cell phones. They cannot be without the cell phone, even for a weekend, the way a baby boomer cannot be without their television for a weekend. Okay, it's the same thing. And then if you go back to World War II, a lot of them have already passed away. For them, it was the radio. Okay, they can't be anywhere without their radio. So each generation has their technology. So when you're dealing with Generation Z, someone so young, you need to be very good with social apps, your, 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 especially if you're teaching. If you're a teacher, if you're going to have a Generation Z student, because I think that's how old a Generation Z is currently. That's born 1997 to 2010. That's the age of my nieces and nephews. If you're going to get their attention, you got to know your social apps, okay? And tw like, like not Twitter, uh, TikTok, I think, com comes to mind. My, my niece likes to dance on TikTok. Then she would make her father dance on TikTok because her father looks so stupid dancing on TikTok. And that's how come she has her father dancing alongside her because then her friends would watch and laugh at her father. And, and of course, my cousin is such a, in such good nature, he doesn't mind. He has such fun looking like an idiot on TikTok. So that's generation, that's generation Z. So how do I pitch my idea? Okay, so if I want to pitch my idea in business, all right, you would use anecdotes and case studies. In other words, use the power of storytelling, just like we did with in our narrative essay. So if you, if you want to give a bad pitch, if you give to our nonprofit, we help young incarcerated people get jobs. Your money will be well spent. Boring. Better pitch. Jenny is a young incarcerated teenager about to be released. Jenny says, oh my God, I have no family. I did not finish high school. I have no job skills. If I go back out on the street, I'll be back in jail again. What can I do? Let us help young people like Jenny, for your donation will go a long way to helping the Jennies of the world provide job training uh, skills and so you can help with your generous donation. So that is the power of using stories. So if you're going to have your LinkedIn profile, instead of having a list of all of your accomplishments, tell a story of how what you did that, that actually gave profit to your company. I'll, 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 t I'll show you that later. So here, use stories to make your message come alive. Stories bring presentations alive. It stays with the audience. Stories create a bond between the teller and the listener. It makes the abstract ideas real and vivid, and it offers endless opportunities to, to humanize your topic. And so, um, what was I gonna say? So here's a simple and practical way to think about stories for messaging, for business. A story tells what happened. It tells what can happen. It gives a human face to your topic. So here's where you can, these are the four kinds of stories that work well with business. Discovery. This is how I started my business. I discovered my talent or passion for teaching and I developed a way to create a company that matches my values. And so that's how I started my business because I discovered my passion. Bumpy road. I faced many obstacles in my life. I even uh, slept in a car. I went from homeless to Harvard. Okay, that's that's the bumpy road kind of business story. Success story. You can use my product. I invented this product and it will achieve and improve your life. And so I solved a major problem. So invention, okay, success story, invention. Big vision. 
how much better the world will be when everybody reaps the benefit, it's similar to success story, of my service or product. Just look at the big picture. Imagine the whole world having a uh, um, something that can produce water, okay? Uh, I, th I think somebody actually created a machine that can that can take water out of the air, okay? So can you imagine if uh, the people in the Sahara Desert had my machine that can take water out of the air? We can turn all the deserts of the world into an oasis. So that would be big vision. So these are the four kinds of stories that work well for business. Uh, yeah. So where would you put these stories? You would put these in brochures and marketing materials, a speech or presentation, a media feature about your, about your business, special event pro promotions like company anniversaries, posting in your office as a framed piece, a blog, and then if you're going to um, do a website in the About Us version of a website, an elevator pitch, which I'll go over what that is later, a job application cover letter, online profiles, and pitches for investment or other support. So how many of you have done all of this sort of stuff? Is write stories for any of the above. You have? What did you do? Which ones? I think I've done all of the above because uh, I worked in marketing since 2001 till now. So I've, I've practically done everything from uh, handing out pamphlets to, you know, pitch on a web then done the elevator pitch the 30 second pitch also oh, hey, Camille. sorry go ahead yeah and uh i've spoken at seminars so practically all of those things oh wow so you're 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 the tra you're the trainer huh I, I did a lot of these things like i was in advertising before i was in teaching so i remember that i did a lot of brochures and marketing i did a lot of writing i was in communications i don't know if you're not too surprised about that, huh? And so I did a lot of writing and stories. And also I did a lot of editing. I was in charge of correcting other people's, like they would hand me their papers and I had to correct all of their grammar mistakes. Because very, that's another story. It's very funny um, how that happened. But in all of my jobs, it, it's all got to do with communication, writing, and editing. I even helped uh, edit the script to Hercules. I don't know if you remember that that TV show. Back in the 90s, I edited mm -hmm. the script and corrected the spelling of oh, wow. people's, uh, uh, it was, it's a long story, but so all of my jobs involve writing and editing. I bet you you're not surprised, are you? Huh? No, yeah. Not at all. But have, have, did you ever watch that show on A&E called Flip This House? Uh, maybe, maybe, yeah. The name of the guru behind that was Armando Montelongo. Uh-huh. Yeah, so I I worked with him for over a decade, and uh, that's where I, I spoke at the seminars and did the online marketing. Actually, sold the programs over the phone. So that's, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did that too, selling things over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's got a lot of crazy stories to it too. Yep. Oh, I'm not going to I'm not going to go into that one. But boy, <laughs> you li literally you would do anything to sell a product. Um, and all the all the tricks. I, I was like, you could do that. Oh, my God. Isn't that isn't that bugging? Oh, yeah. the, isn't that bugging the consumer a little too much? We're going to sell the product. <laughs> gonna sell the product. And it was all about selling. Everybody had a nut on uh, it. It's, Never mind. Anyway, that was a long time ago. Anyway, so um, and also another thing is smile while you talk. If you are talking on the phone to make sales, try smiling as you talk. When you smile, this changes your vocal cords and you end up sounding friendlier to the customer. So I don't know if I sound friendlier if I do this, but it has to be a, a, a real smile. And then um, never write an angry email. Always maintain a professional tone. Avoid writing when angry or agitated. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. How would you feel if you received an angry angry email. Hey, I need a new desk for my office. Have you any idea how much work I have to do? Uh, sitting at this old desk hurts my back. Can't you people find the money in your budget to get me that desk? Uh, how, would you, how would you react if you're in budgeting? So yes, I had a boss who did talk like that, by, by the way. Um, so that, that, was a, that was a long time ago. 
So if you don't have the luxury of waiting for a good mood, then just go out and take a walk and don't press that submit. It's easier said than done because I know at times I'm not supposed to send that angry email, but I did it anyway because I was just too emotional. Uh, people, it feels good to send it, huh? Yeah, yeah. You, you, it, 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 it's just, it's just supposed to, you're supposed to wait, but a lot of times, so, but people prefer in business, they prefer you not to be so angry because if you do angry things or emotional things, you look unprofessional. They prefer you to be cool under, you know, cool under, under pressure. You got to be positive, dynamic, enthusiastic, and they want people who are also, so try not to, not to complain or criticize because I know people who used to complain. I, I remember I worked somewhere and this one person, all she did was complain, complain, complain about everything. And after a while, we all wanted to avoid her, you know, like the plague. But um, yes, yeah, so you always want to be positive. That's not always easy to do, especially if you don't like that person or if you don't like the boss. Um, use more you than I in your pitches. So this we already covered. So we created a new software that is exciting. Our great software helps build new websites. And C, want a, a faster way to knock out that home page in half the time? Try out our new software. And so C is the most exciting one because you're talking directly. When you use you, as you can, you can uh, give us some examples of how would you use you instead of the above, Anil? Um, do you want Anil. me to use this example? If you want, no, no, you can come up with your own example. Okay. Uh, when I was selling the real estate coaching, okay, um, I guess my pitch in that sense would be, you know, imagine if you have the ability to go and buy a home without having to worry about where the money is going to come from. Yeah, it's all, always got to be the benefits of what, what it, what's in it for me. You know, why should I care? Yes. And so you're, you're the expert in, in, in marketing. And boy, I, I, I didn't like sales because it was so much pressure. Um, not, not my thing. I prefer teaching skills. That's a lot more fun for me. Yeah. You always got to find in a job, you got to find your passion, you know? And so I'm doing the, the business story number one, finding your passion, you know? Anyway, so avoid using jargon or difficult words. Use basic English in your messages. Do not assume that your audience will know your alphabet soup. So when I first started this job and I was reading all the introductions and students would say, I was a CNA and I was an LN and now I want to be an RN. And I remember my very first class teaching at this school and I had no idea what a CNA was, what an RN, but the other nurses were talking to each other, nurse to nurse, understood. Mm -hmm. So um, what if I were to say, TESOL is a great place to learn ELL learning strategies, but if you have not read any ELL literature lately, you should go back to TESOL again. Would you understand what that meant? Oh. <laughs> no, but the other ESL teachers would, have, would, would know. They would go, oh yeah, I love TESOL. Did you go to the last conference? So teaching English as a second language, as an other, another language, ELL stands for English Language Learner, that sort of thing. Here's another one from IT. These visible IT capabilities, along with IT participation in the project identification process, can drive infusion of IT leverage on revenue improvement. Wow. Do you understand that jargon a little bit? Just the I, IT part. <laughs> I understood it's got something to do with profit and yeah. computers. And, 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 and of course, that's not much, uh, you know, revenue improvement. They tell you not to say revenue improvement. They just t tell you to say profit, okay? Now avoid uh, long explanations like revenue improvement. Just say the word profit. Um, mm -hmm. Keep it short. And then make sure your ideas are well connected. And so transition words. Yes, you, gotta, you, you need transition words in business writing. So transitions can consist of single words, phrases, or sentences. They can be put to work within a sentence to link sentences and to connect paragraphs. Think of them as in, in the following categories. So here you have t different ways of saying and, additionally, also, consequently. These are all different. Instead of saying and, 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 you would use these words. And instead of saying but, you would, uh, you would say however, alternately, 
uh, nevertheless, despite, in other words, those are different ways of saying, but. And then to establish a time, instead of saying then, 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 you would say this. So that's, you, you would use transition words. Don't use too many transition words, in other words. Oh, here's some more transition words. And so here's more ways of saying but, more ways of saying therefore, okay? So use transition words, and then here, use parallel structure in your bullets. So if you're going to use bullets, make sure that if you're going to use all past tense, or all present tense, or all future tense. So keep all of your bullets in the same verb tense. That's verb tense consistency. And this is very important, especially if you're going to go into technical writing. All right. So in business writing, try to use conversational but professional style, non-emotional tone, number systems familiar to your readers, and consistent, consistent style for charts and, and, and graphs. And so here in the journalists, which would watch your grammar, don't use double negatives. Double negatives mean I don't do nothing. Then you have a double negative. You're supposed to say I don't do anything. Okay, so one, make sure each pronoun agrees with their antecedent. So I wouldn't say um, Jackie, he, or, or uh, that sort of thing. So you have to make sure that your pronoun agrees. Join clauses together with a conjunction with should, and, but, or with any kind of conjunction, so you have sentence variety. Avoid sentence fragments, okay? Um, and avoid uh, dangling modifiers. Verbs have to agree with their subjects. In other words, they are, he is, subject verb agreement, and also you and I. So we use subject pronouns before the verb, and then we use object pronouns after the verb. So that's, that covers this, this one. Don't write run-on sentences. So you got to watch your punctuation and avoid fused sentences and run-on sentences. Don't use commas which aren't necessary because that becomes a comma splice. Try to never use split infinitives. That's something we didn't cover. What is a split infinitive? A split Boy, infinitive. So if I were to say to dance, to eat, that's an infinitive. So if I was to say to nicely dress, uh, to nicely eat, okay, that's a split infinitive because I put another word in between to and eat. So you should keep the to and eat together and avoid split infinitives because a split infinitive makes you sound too conversational. It makes you sound uneducated and it makes you sound like you come from, uh, well, anyway, so you got to try to split and try to avoid split infinitives. It's important to use your apostrophes correctly. And here, she, they, they uh, uh, d d d deliberately put apostrophe incorrect. So here, you're supposed to say, use your apostrophes without the apostrophe. So when do we use an apostrophe? So this we did go over. Possessive, you, to show possession. To show possession, to show contractions, okay? So we use for possessive and contractions, apostrophes, not for, you know, plural. Proofread your writing to make sure your spelling is correct and avoid unnecessary words like for like as you can see in this essay I'm going to talk about okay so avoid um, unnecessary redundancy avoid cliches like the plague isn't that cute what they wrote so in other words like the plague is a um, is a cliche can you give me other examples of cliches you can avoid like the plague. Off the top of your head. Something like, you know, cold as a welder's butt kind of thing, you know. Uh, like similes, uh, basically. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. yeah you, you, don't, you don't want to sound too... I actually have an entire um, presentation on avoiding cliches. I haven't had to... I, I, I made the PowerPoint, but I don't think I, I ever... Uh, recorded the uh, the lesson, you know. I did give the lesson, but I didn't keep the recording. So if you're interested, I, I have a whole thing on on that. I'll, I'll post it in the in the in the um, announcements. Okay. Yep. So and then when we create a business letter or an email, you go through the same three pre-writing, writing, and rewriting writing process in which you plan, uh, you you pre-write and purpose preliminary research outline. So that's pre-writing. 
Then you write out your layout, or you write out your rough draft, or your phrasing and pages, and then the last step is revise, proofreading, and verify your purpose. And so here's the same thing. I'm not going to go through all of this. Stick to one idea. Use proper APA. Uh, uh, yeah, use proper and have someone uh, read it to you. Grammar tips, we just went over all of that. And so what is the writing process at the workplace? Same thing as... It's like no... Um know what what generation the person was in so you'll know how to approach them like you said earlier like generation z if, they, if it should be a phone call or um in person stuff like that yeah 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 you you you, you would do your do your research on uh, also there's also if you're going to write to your boss there's also a way to do that too you got to know their generation you got to know their preferences and that sort of thing um, okay, so positive versus negative messages. So here we're going to review the sandwich method that we learned for peer review. Okay, so here we, we see peer review. How do we give bad news or good news at work? And so here, how we do it? The sandwich method. In other words, you start with a positive uh, statement, then you give the bad news, which is the areas of improvement, and then you uh, end with another positive statement. So if you were to say, John, it was really great doing business with you last week. However, our supplier is going to be two weeks late with our shipment. Um, then end with another, uh, it's been great doing business with you. And as soon as the shipment comes in, we will let you know. And you've been a great client all these years. Um, sincerely, John Smith. Okay. So here you start with the uh, you've been a great client, uh-oh, our supply is going to be late, and then you end with a positive saying, don't worry, it won't be, won't be late next week, this is just a one-time occurrence. And so here you have positive feedback, negative feedback, more positive feedback, and this is known as the sandwich method. And so you, you not only do this for um, business letters, but also if you're going to give some somebody a job performance review, so you're going to uh, tell somebody, John, you know, you're a great worker. You come in on time all the time, but you really need to work on uh, your whatever it is he has to work on. And, and then you would say, and I hope that once you make the, those improvements, you might actually get yourself a raise or something like that. So use feedback sandwich. Um, we did this, I think, for the peer review, so I'm just going to go through this um, really, really fast. So give a reason. For, use the sandwich method, prepare the listener for the bad news in a professional, unemotional tone as brief as possible. Do it just once, clearly. Pre present alternative solutions or compromises as a way out of the problem, and then always stay on a positive note. Uh, and that's it. So, um, have you ever used the sandwich method for anything, Lisa? Jamila, have you ever? I'm here. It oh, won't oh, let sucks. me undo, but um, I have actually. Um, when you're a supervisor at my job, you kind of have to do the sandwich method, or people think that they're attacking you, you know, or you, they think that you're attacking them. You know, when you're talking to them, and um, so yeah, I do use the sandwich method a lot. Oh yeah, I use it. I use it a lot too. Uh, what about you, Jamila? Have you used the sandwich method? Um, I've used the sandwich method, not knowing that I was using the sandwich method. Like when I'm talking to my children, you know what I mean? It'd be like, you did this right. But I don't know what you was thinking here, but this is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people, some people actually d d do it, do it naturally. But right. Them. All right. So the next one is about working abroad. So international communications. And so in other cultures. So I know that uh, Anil told me that you've, you've worked abroad, haven't you? I studied abroad. Oh, you studied abroad. Okay. Where did you study? Uh, I lived in Malaysia from uh, 90, no, not 90, 80, 89 through 95. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So I, I was in France um, and I studied also, I was in Taiwan. So those are the two places I was. I was actually, I've never been to China, uh, believe it or not, but I have been to Taiwan. So when you study abroad, you have to be aware of the culture because cultural awareness is important to global business. 
And so if a culture is made up of agreed upon expectations in which a group of people act in a certain way or adopt certain traditions together. And so um, you need to be aware of what those traditions or customs are in order, if you're going to do business abroad, in order to avoid misunderstandings. For instance, eye contact. In Asia, eye contact, you avoid eye contact to show respect. In the West, if you avoid eye contact, people think you're lying to them. And so that is one difference that you, you need to know, that when an Asian person looks away, they're not trying to lie to you, they're trying to show respect, because looking straight in the eye means that we're even, that we're, we're, we're the same, we're of the same stature. When someone who's 50 years old, eh, they don't consider themselves the same stature or, or, prestige, or rank as someone that's 25. So looking down is, and also body space is another one. Anyway, most Western cultures are individual-based cultures. That, that is, decisions are made for the benefit of the individual. For instance, American business accepts competition and believes competition produces better performance in the workplace. Most Asian cultures are group-based cultures. That is, decisions are made for the benefit of the group. In Japan, competition is thought to create disharmony in the workplace and to best be avoided, and all decisions are made by the group together on what is to be done. Have you come across this in Asian culture, anybody? Yes, I have. You have. And did you, did you find it disconcerting? Well, um, initially, yes, because I was not used to it. But um, you have to understand the environment that you're in to, and kind of adapt to it. Yeah, I mean, another one is shaking hands or bowing. And so in, in, in Japan and in Asia, they bow to each other to show respect. And you have to know the, and there are hundreds of bows, different ways of bowing. And Europe has this too, but for different reasons. But in, in, in America, it's the handshake. If you don't have a firm handshake, and people think you're weak or something, something like that. At least that's what it is in the movies. So, um, although I don't know, I, I heard that because of the pandemic, now it's gone back to a, a elbow bump or, or something else in order to avoid germs or something like that. That's what I heard. So, uh, so East versus West in business, how people interact. In other words, so in other countries, so uh, in the United States, it's about independence, individualism, and, and, and um, competition. And in other parts of the world, like in Firms in Western Europe, in North and South America, lean towards a high level of independence. However, this tendency is different in different places. So it, here I'll show you, you see. So in Asia, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, in other words, it's more char characterized by interdependence and, co and cooperation. In these regions, we found workplaces that embody caring and a sense of safety and planning. The same thing in the Middle East. Okay, in the Middle East, it's about safety and security, and then working together as a group, as a family, um, that sort of thing. So I didn't put that in. And nonverbal communication. Okay, that I, I gave the example of the uh, of the eye contact as well as body language. And I think in certain cultures, if you were to go like this or go like this, that's that's kind of rude. I think that in some cultures, if you go like this. That's some kind of uh, cursing or something. And in Taiwan, if you do this, that's very, very rude. That's, that means that you're totally angry at somebody, like all caps or something. So you have to be aware of how, uh, how your body language, which in the United States might be innocuous, this means come here, but in other countries that's something different. So you've got to be aware of your body language. You've got to learn the body language of another country. In other countries, you don't just smile blankly at everybody. People will find that rude. In other countries, smiling at people is only reserved for someone you really know. In Europe, for instance, you don't just smile at anybody. You smile at someone that you love or someone that you care for deeply, and everybody else you just, because otherwise it's seen, seen as in, ingenuous, like you're not being authentic if you just simply smile at everybody. And so in the United States, you smile at everybody in order to show friendliness. 
So you've got to be aware of nonverbal communication. In China, when they first had the McDonald's, they actually had to teach the workers to smile all the time. You know, Otherwise, Americans who come to the McDonald's in China would perceive them as not being very friendly. So nonverbal communication, uh, and so these differences, nonverbal communication, can lead to miscommunication in the workplace. So uh, anybody travel abroad and ever come across different body language they didn't know? Yes. Yeah, um, I mean, um, with regards to, like you brought up the uh, European side of things to the American side of things, okay? Like uh, in, um, in America, if, if somebody speaks another language, we will try to, you know, do whatever we can to understand their broken English. Okay. Most European countries, you get looked down upon if you don't speak their language. So you can't just talk in English and expect them to behave the same way with you. So if you, they want you to be able to communicate in their own language. Yeah. When, when my father went to France, and my father didn't know how to speak French. He was very frustrated and all he wanted to do was ask where the hotel was and where the uh, bathroom was. And he couldn't, you know, because he couldn't speak any French. And I remember at the time they were visiting me in Paris and I, um, I was the one that could speak French. I was the one that led them around. And so if in France, if you can speak French, they will accept you. However, when we went to Italy, the Italians went out of their way to try to speak English. I remember we, we stopped by a store and the, the, the merchant took one look at us and thought we were Chinese and started speaking, do you want to buy my product in Chinese? Then when we looked at them blankly, then he switched to Japanese, do you want to buy my product? And then when we still looked at them blankly, he finally switched to English, do you want to buy my product? So he will actually try 10 different languages that he would try to guess what you are and then finally when the person responds then he guesses your nationality or something like that but that's only in the marketplace when he wants to sell you something so i found that very amusing that finally english was the last one that he came upon <laughs> because i look you know asian and so i was like i don't mm -hmm. you know i looked at him like huh anyway uh so writing to international audiences so many cultures, especially in business, are more formal than in the U.S. So you should use formal English, you should use complete sentences, and then you don't just go, hey Tom, what's up? And use the proper form of address, like Mr. Smith, or use the person's formal title, like Sir Paul McCartney. Um, tell your peers how to address you. Um, to, in other words, you ask them, what's, what's your name? And then pay attention to how they say, I'm Sir John Smith. And then you don't just say, hey, John, what's up? You have to say, yes, Sir John, or something like that. So you got to be aware of titles. And also in, in, in Asia, there are many different ways of saying you. Um, it's not just simply you. Um, there's, there's a you for form for formal occasions. There's a you for for uh, children, there's a U for, and there's also a, the gazillion different ways to, 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 to bow. So it, it, it pays, if you're going to do business abroad, is to take a class in, in cultural awareness of that country so that you don't make mistakes like that. Um, let's see, what else? So how would you define culture? Lisa, how would you define culture? Um, culture, I mean, it's, um, I mean, we just learned this in one of our classes, but, um, culture is the place that you live, uh, what you do, belief systems, um, food, things like that in that culture. Um, I mean, that's what makes it up for me is, you know, there's different, uh, areas you live in, the beliefs that you do, religion, um, places you mingle, those kinds of things that make up a culture. And uh, what kinds of different beliefs, values and beliefs do different cultures have? Jamila. Um, they vary. I was actually not what I was going to say. I think more aligns with the nonverbal communication because I was going to say that um, people can be offended if you, um, if you do this, 
but to you, you think it as nothing, but to them, like I said, it's an insult, but I guess it kind of goes into values and beliefs because if you don't know, if you didn't study that culture, you can be offending them because that's not part of your belief, but you didn't do your Yeah, like, like I did this, I was in Taiwan and I actually right. did this. And in the United States, I think that just shows, I think, I don't know what, it shows you're bored or something mm -hmm. or, 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 or it shows that you can't wait to go. Anyway, but in Taiwan, it, it makes it look like that you're angry at someone. Because I remember I did this and then the person said, oh, are you angry with me? Did I say something to offend you? Suddenly he was like, I was like, where did that come from? You know? And then my, the person goes, you're going like this. That means you're angry, right? And I'm like, really? If I go like this, it means I'm angry? And she goes, yeah, in Taiwan, that's what it is. And stuff that's when I became aware of body language and then I after that I became much more careful in um, what what I did and how I you know you can't go like this so that's very interesting isn't it that you can't it is in, in Taiwan um, mm -hmm. in the United States it's, it, it makes it look like you're impatient actually it, de it depends on the context but mm -hmm. um, yeah <laughs> so uh, anyway uh, oh and in, in France if I want if I wanted in the United States you would say I don't know in France, you go, ben, j'en sais rien, ben, your whole face, the whole side of your face falls down and stuff like that. But in, in both France and in, in, in America, we, we would say, j'en ai assez, j'en ai assez. Would you, can you guess what that means in English? Uh, sound like you saying, go on or something, I don't know, get out the way. No, I, no I, I was saying it in French. It sounds like whatever. Words. Yeah, yeah, like whatever. Like, right? Yes, yeah, whatever. It's more like I've had enough. I've had it up yeah. to here. Okay. Mm -hmm. In English, it's I've had it up to here. And then he in French, you would say I've had it up to here, or I've had enough of it. You, you actually go over. Oh, anyway. And you learn. I learned a lot of the their their gestures. Believe it or not, was television. You know, um, when people would would get excited and talk like this and stuff like that. So it's for me that's very fascinating. Uh, body language and different cultures. So I, I, I put this in here because a lot of people said in the forums they want to be travel nurses. So if you're going to be a travel nurse, you need to be aware of other cultures, other values. I guess that's why they, they, they were teaching you that in your other classes for people who want to be travel nurses, right? Yeah. Okay. So business uh, etiquette uh, for groups. This should be very, you know, so here, in, these, these are all etiquette rules for the United States. Okay, you start on time, you come to the meeting prepared, you focus comments on the issues, you avoid personal attacks, you let each person speak once before you speak again. Why is that one important? Because in other countries, everybody can speak at the same time. And so, and that's okay. And in other countries, you don't have to start on time, okay? You can start, it's okay, it's okay to be fashionably late, especially in, in, in France and Italy. You can show up an hour late and nobody would, 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 would mind, okay? And so in the United States, you have to be on time. Same thing with Britain, okay? The United States got a lot of its uh, culture from Britain. And so how to receive group feedback. And so seek out feedback rather than dread feedback. See group feedback not as a threat, but as a chance to learn and grow. See group feedback um, as a suggestion for room for improvement. Ask others regularly how you are doing on the job as part of the team. So how to give feedback. When you give feedback on someone else's performance, be clear in your message. This is the same thing I gave you for the peer review, in case you're wondering why this sounds familiar. Jan is too laid back when she works in a group. So what does the boss mean by laid back? So the correct way would be, Jan does not have a professional enough tone when she speaks to other group members. She needs to speak in a more formal style and stop saying, you know, you know, you know, you know, at the end of each sentence. I remember I knew someone who did that. It was so annoying. She ended each sentence with, yeah, I had a really great weekend, you know? And then my boyfriend, he was really mad at me, you know, you know, that sort of thing. So that was really annoying. And then we complained to the boss saying she, she didn't have to end every sentence with, you know, you know, you know. And also when you're writing your email, watch your tone. So listen to these three emails. March, didn't I already ask you five times to review the draft? I spent 23 hours writing and give me your input. Remember. I'm at a standstill, and if I don't hear from you by 3.30 tomorrow, I'll assume you have nothing to say and go ahead on my own. Matt. 
So that's version one. Version two, Marge, I'm still waiting for your input on the draft I sent Tuesday. This is creating problems. Any chance you can get back to me this week? So version one and two both sound rude. And then the correct version would be, hi Marge, I know what a busy time of year this is, but we'll really appreciate your input on the Marshall draft. You may recall we promised to deliver it Monday. Is it possible for you to take a look at it by the end of the week? It will be a big help, best map. So have you ever had bosses that sounded like version one and version two? Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually version one, so uh, we need to talk about this. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when we, you know, put something out there and we're typing, you know, we're, we're talking it out in our head and we're already mad. And so how we're thinking it is how we're typing it. So, uh, you know, usually when you're typing something, kind of got to take a step back before you start yeah, writing or, something, before you attack somebody, because you'll it's more of an attack. It's very angry and violent almost. <laughs> didn't I already ask you five times? To, that sounds like my first grade teacher when, when we didn't do our homework and you had to go to the board and write 500 times, I will do my homework. I will it's do almost my like homework. being reprimanded by a parent versus... Yes. You know, yeah, and, and, the ver and version boss. two, and version two is more passive aggressive. I'm waiting for your input. This is creating. In other words, you're still aggressive, but in a more passive way. I think that's the most common one. Uh, is version two. So, so when you do it, like, well, I know these are kind of obviously rude or whatever. Um, because a lot of times when I'm I'm writing, I don't, because I've been told it's, they can see sense of tone, and I'm not upset. Just that I'm kind of like trying to get straight to the point to get to what I'm trying to do, you know? Um, but in um, the last one you're saying, so you kind of like try to see it from the other person's point of view as you're speaking to them, say, I understand things, you know. Yeah, the, the, that, third, the third that? version has sandwich, has the sandwich method, if you gotcha. know. Okay, okay, all right. The, 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 the third one says, I appreciate your input. Okay, that's something positive on the Marshall draft. But then now he's moving into the bad news. You may recall, we promised to deliver it by Monday. Is it possible for you to take a look at it by the end of the week? So that's the, can you do me a favor is the area of improvement. So that's the middle part. And then you end with a, a, a nice, something nice. It will be a big help, best mat. You know, so the last one is the sandwich method. Actually, this is how the sandwich method looks and it sounds out of the three, sounds the best. And also another thing is when you're at work writing uh, confirm that you and your boss are on the same page. So write a backup memo confirming you understand what needs to be done for the project. Make sure you and your boss are on the same page to avoid misunderstandings. In other words, when writing with, when communicating with subordinates and peers. So let's say your boss says, I want you to look over this class and curriculum and I want book one, book two, book three to, 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 to uh, reflect the most recent initiative. Then afterwards, you would, you would write back and say um, to the boss, so you want me to look over book one, two, and three, and you want me to look over initiative three, four, and five. Is that right? In other words, you send another email to back up to make sure that, they, that you understood what they want. That's known as writing a backup memo. It's just like when you order pizza and you have the guy repeat after you, okay, so what did I say I wanted ordered? Um, you said you want the pepperoni and pizza and you want the spaghetti with the, on the side. Yes, that's correct. So, so you make sure that they got the right order. So the same thing as you and, because this will really, because I remember um, my boss used to talk really fast and ex she was very impatient and she would want, she would, she would say a lot of stuff at once of what you wanted, what she wanted you to do. And it was like, took all my concentration to figure out, you know, what it was. And so a lot of times I had to repeat it back to her to make sure I didn't miss anything, especially if the person talks really fast on the phone. Yes, this was a baby boomer boss, yeah, on the phone, now that I think about it. But um, so here, um, dear Luke, thanks for taking the time to talk through the Melody account this morning. Here is my understanding of what you said. We will recommend two possible courses, option A, option B, option C. If this doesn't accord with your understanding or needs or further thought, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll proceed on this early next week. So basically, she, she rewrote what she thought the boss wants. And once the boss confirms it, then you're on the same page. Okay, so that's important. 
working with a boss. Never play the blame game. If your boss makes a mistake or stands you up for an appointment, um, let your boss off the hook without letting go of what you need. You can give your boss a slight nudge in the right direction, but do so courteously. And so I learned that, um, let's see, I had a new boss that I wasn't familiar with, and then um, when I first talked with her about my situation, I wasn't very concise. I tend to be too talkative, and also I tended to be negative. I said, well, the class that I went over was really bad because someone did a really bad design, and someone didn't know what they were doing, and so on and so on like that. And then the boss misunderstood, thinking that I was the one who had the bad design, and I was the one who didn't know what I was doing, when actually I had received the class already in that condition. And then the other boss wanted me to, to fix it. You see, that was the... So when I tried to try to get the boss to, you know, to fix what I said, because she misunderstood everything, and then she thought I was blaming her and correcting her. And after that, the relationship went south for the winter. And so if your boss makes a mistake, you, you can let it go, okay, for some, uh, to some extent, okay? And so uh, no one likes to feel belittled or cr criticized, especially from, from a subordinate. So if your boss ignores you, you just let it go, and you, but you got to stay positive and going forward. So you would say, well, you know, boss, I guess the reason why you stood me up, you wouldn't actually say you stood me up, you would say, I know you've been traveling and how hard it is to catch up. So that's why we weren't able to meet yesterday. Okay, so instead of saying, uh, oh, you stood me up yesterday, why weren't you there? Okay, so you, you, you have to be more diplomatic. Uh, this may have fallen through the cracks when so much is going on. As in, so you, you, give the excuse, you give your boss an excuse for why she stood you up. I know everyone's pressing you for figures this week, or it looks like we had a miscommunication, and that sort of thing. So you, you sort of put the blame on circumstances or on yourself, and then you go on to say, but I still need your help with this, this, and this. So you, get, you let your boss a little off the hook. You don't try to correct them, and yet you still, you still mention what it is you needed from the boss to begin with. Does that make sense? Everybody already knows how to do this, right? Yeah, yeah, this is all this is all common sense. This is all very common sense. And also I learned that um, if once I get to know the boss and they've uh, gotten and we and, and I've won their trust, then it's okay to say um, to correct them or to once you get and I made the mistake of not uh, I mean because I had had so many bosses and I just felt comfortable with everybody and I just didn't anyway. So don't make my mistake, okay? Um, so why is it always important to be positive? And also, why is it always important to be concise? Like, what was my mistake when I kept saying, oh, this class is bad, this class is bad, and then I went on for a half an hour about what was bad about the class? You, you just bring a negative, like, vibe. I mean, everybody's, uh, you know, it's all, it's all negative. I mean, um, when you don't bring in the positive about something, it's just, it, it's, you're like Debbie Downer. Yes. So. Yeah. I'm the stick in the mud, the Debbie Downer. Yeah. And, and I, I, I remember that at the time, and then of course there's misunderstandings. If you're not concise and you talk too much that, or if your email is too long, people may not read it all and would, would, would not, and so she misunderstood, thinking that I was the one who don't know how to do anything, that I was the one who couldn't design a good class, when actually I was saying that the person, you know, I received the class like this, and I was told by the boss that I was the one who had to clean it up, and she misunderstood everything. Um, and after that, when I tried to correct her, it just didn't, you know, I was trying to, I was actually trying to correct her understanding. I wasn't trying to correct her. And so that's why I always tell um, my students that um, when we do an evaluation, we're not correcting the person, we're correcting the paper, we're correcting the issue. So we always stick with the issue and the paper, and we make that clear that we're not attacking the person. Because once the, the person thinks that you're attacking them, after that it goes downhill really fast. And I, I learned that the hard way. Uh, my mother always told me, why is it you always have to learn everything the hard way, and if I try to tell you the right way of doing something, you don't listen. You've got to always fall on your face, and, which is true. Uh, that's a bad trait, so don't do it like me. Uh, different kinds of correspondence. Now we're going to go on, into for, the formatting of different kinds of business communications. 
So you've got different kinds of correspondence, internal correspondence, such as promotional letters, reprimand, instructions to the team, and less formal email. And then you have external correspondence, which is business letters, sales correspondence, like sales proposals, personal co correspondence, like appreciation letters, circulars, like memos or announcements, that's interior to the entire company. And also you can make um, uh, circulars and brochures using Adobe Spark Canva, and that I'll go over too, is how to make um, brochures. So no matter what kind of correspondence, they all have the same format introduction, middle, conclusion, and all talk about one central idea. Now that's the main mistake that I see in most communications that I get is when someone tries to put, that, which, is, which was my mistake by the way, uh, was when you try to put too much in one email. So when you write an email or a business letter or any kind of correspondence, just like when you write an essay, you stick with one request, one idea, one thing, one item. Then if you want to go on to number two, you, you, that's another email or that's another uh, business letter. So that way your boss focuses on that one thing and doesn't get confused and misunderstand things. It's all about not misunderstanding things. And um, here is, and then when you start a new job, okay, you can write a letter of introduction. This is the first kind of uh, writing. So introduce yourself when you first start a new job, when you apply for it, this is sort of like a cover letter, okay? So when you apply for a new job, when you start a new business, when you want to pitch your business to potential clients, it's like the about me or about us section of your business website. For teachers, this is the cover letter that you send with your resume, and this is your teaching philosophy letter also that you send with your resume. So how would you introduce yourself in a cover letter? What would you put in your introduction? And this is similar to elevator pitch. What would be your elevator pitch? What would you say if you had only 15 seconds to introduce yourself to a person? What would you say of who you are and what you do? Uh, Lisa, in 15 seconds, tell me who you are, what you do, impress me to hire you. 15 um, seconds. My name is Avalicia Santiago. I am a licensed practical nurse. I have been a nurse now for 15 years and I work all different departments, trauma, cardiac, uh, med surge. Uh, I'm awesome at what I do. Um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> okay, you, you did the 15 seconds. Okay, what about you, Anil? Go ahead. You have 15 seconds to tell me everything about you. I've been a professional in the business field for quite a while now, worked in various uh, scenarios, uh, a lot of experience from the army as well in leadership positions. So becoming a nurse at this point certainly puts me in a position where I can be quite interpersonal and uh, have uh, can, can be taught to pay a lot of attention to detail to what I need to do to and uh, provide selfless service as well. Good. Okay. And Jamila, how, how, what, how would you introduce yourself in 15 seconds? You're muted. Sorry. Um, 15 seconds. Uh, oh, I don't know. I, I couldn't do it. It's called, it's this whole thing is called a letter of introduction as well as an elevator pitch. So they call it an elevator pitch. Is if you were in an elevator and you, you, you saw your boss the, the, and, and you wanted to impress that person and you want to impress him before you get off the elevator and you have 15 seconds as the elevator goes from one floor to the next, you do your pitch. It's called an elevator pitch speech. So this is, this is, this is very uh, common. It's similar to a business card. Instead of just handing mm -hmm. the person your business card, you give an L you, you say, my name is so-and-so and I'm working in marketing and I would love to do such and such an account with your, your, your business. Here's my card, bye, ding, and the elevator opens and everyone leaves. That's called an elevator pitch. Here it's very similar, letter of introduction. When you open a new business in the community, assume a new role in the company or take over a professional practice. Introducing yourself in a letter is well worth your time. A letter of introduction is really great for building relationships and sounding the right note. Start by thinking about your audience. Suppose you're an 
accountant and you're taking over as head of a firm specializing in corporate tax counseling, you want to retain the firm's existing clients and build relationships with them. So how would, you, how would this letter look? So here you would write a letter of introduction. Dear Mr. Smith, or Wish, I'm happy to introduce myself as the new managing partner of Pembroke Tax Accountants. As you may know, my good friend and colleague Tom S Smith uh, retired in June. I want to assure you that my goal is to give you the same level of personal service and counsel you're accustomed to in every way. I have been an enthusiastic tax consultant for 22 years. I discovered my passion for it. Now this goes back to the four kinds of, remember the four kinds of business letters in which you have your discovery, my passion, then my obstacles, and then um, my invention, and how I'm going to take over the world. I remember those were the four kinds of, so I have been an enthusiastic tax uh, consultant. It's my passion to work. I've overcome many obstacles. I had the privilege of working with famous clients. I am especially proud to contribute to our community, which is the big picture. I am working on additional ways to make your tax experience pleasant and production, productive with new technology. I would ver now here you have to, then the conclusion to all your business letter, letters is a call to action conclusion paragraph. So your conclusion paragraph should get your client to get off their feet to do something. So I would very much appreciate meeting with you soon. If you are able to stop by at a time convenient for you, I would prefer a phone conversation. Just let me know and I'll arrange my schedule to accommodate yours. Okay, now we get into generation. If you know that this boss might be an older millennial, you would say, I would love to telephone you sometime. If you know that the, the next person over is millennial, I would like to Zoom with you sometime. Or, uh, or, or whatever, or I would like to meet you, text you sometime. So depending on the generation, that's why it's good to know or have an idea of what age your boss is so that at the end you know to pitch the telephone or the text, which is the youngest generation, or, or, or Skype or Zoom, which is the middle generation. That's, that's, that's why it's important to know your audience, so you know who you're writing to. Another one, another example of a letter of introduction is, Dear Neighbor, you may already be aware that the Fine family next door will begin a home renovation project. As the family's general contractor, I wanted to take a moment of your time to introduce myself. My name is Gary Rand. I am one of the project managers on the site. I will complete this project, noisy project, in about two or three months. I intend to deliver a quality one-time product. If there's any minor damage, to your sidewalk, please call me at such and such a number. I, 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 I said it real short. Uh, by the way, I've never had a contractor that nice. And people would just be very noisy, build something and not care whether it was noisy. But anyway, this is a uh, letter placed by a contractor and this also gives you uh, the contractor future clients because the clients think, wow, he's so nice that he cares about his noise to my, you know, so that's, a, that's an example of a letter of introduction. Now, how do we write an email? So just like with the letter of introduction, you have your introduction paragraph where you write your main idea, just like you would your essay. Then you have one paragraph, okay, if that. And then a conclusion, which is probably one sentence, which would be a call to action. Call me, text me, or Zoom me, depending on the generation, uh, at this number uh, or Zoom address or text number, okay? So that would be your conclusion. And so here, you want to, this is a, how you would, you know, the format of your business email. You have your subject line, salutation message. So you notice how it's very short. Your, your subject line should, should, be, should, should, should leap out of the page and grab the reader's attention. That's similar to an essay hook, which is the first sentence of an essay that grabs the reader's attention. Otherwise, people will just click on your email and just leave. And so, um, here you have the salutation, the message, and then the closing. And then here, so write subject lines that make your email sing. And so must read because of essential information. New location, May 3rd meeting. Chris Brogan, this one improved my life. Free tools to recover deleted files. Lowest iPhone price in history. 
Our baby panda isn't camera shy. Space suit diapers, just like with marketing. And then here you have the effective business letter structure. So here we're going into business letter. So you would have your introduction, your thesis. You would state and identify the problem clearly. Then body paragraphs, further discussion of the problem with data and evidence. Discuss alternative, alternate solutions for the future and call to action. And so I'm going to hurry this along because it's uh, way long. But this is because I had to squeeze two classes of, and each class is like 16 week, two 16 week classes into one PowerPoint. So that's why this is, this, I would never have done it this long if it was not too, um, anyway. So you want to draft a good email lead, okay? And so in your first sentence, you need to have the who, what, where, when, and how of whatever it is you're writing, just like with newspapers. So the first sentence should accomplish the same thing as in a newspaper. Avoid sounding whiny or emotional. Tom, I am so distressed to know I was excluded from the staff meeting last Thursday. Was it an oversight? It makes me feel like you don't value my contribution. Can we talk about this? Would you uh, talk like that to your boss? No. So uh, avoid being whiny. And so if you're going to write an email to your boss, here are the things you should know about. Besides their generation, you should know their demographics. In other words, is, is it a he? Is it a she? Okay. You should know their personality. Does she like statistics? Does she prefer, you know, what is her writing style? Positioning. What is her rank? And psychographics. Um, is she a pro-technology, a true believer, or an early adapter? If you go through all these four points, then you uh, know how to uh, address your boss. This was the mistake that I made in which I didn't know my boss well enough and I got too overly familiar with her and then I tried to correct her and then uh, it, it went south. So had I known that she's the person who doesn't like to be corrected, that she's more of a controlling type, I would never have bothered her to begin with. So you should know your demographics, personality, is she controlling? Is she uh, outgoing? What's the person personality? Is she impatient? Position and psycho. And presto, with these four uh, points, you have a reader profile to help you write Jane, a must-come email, and even more important, a guide that enables you to structure an actual meeting that accomplish exactly what you want. And here, and this we already know, if you're going to write in a, a business letter, you got to think about what do I get out of it? What are my benefits? And so you already know that. And then a well-crafted email message to Jane would sound like, Hi Jane, I'm ready to show you how using new social media can help us increase market share for our entire line. After checking the online calendar for your availability, I scheduled a demo for March 5th at 2 p.m. Can you meet me with my, me and my team then? Um, and so here you have a good beginning, middle, and end. So the end sentence is the call to action. Come meet with me. Come see me. Come buy my product or come or hire me. So that is the call to action is always the, 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 end, the end one. And then give a strong closing to your email. So that is the close to action. And then writing an email to your boss. Be direct. Take a positive tone. Write concisely write correctly and be courteous. And here is a sample memo. Okay. And so here you would have the to, the from, the date, and the subject. And so um, now I'm going to get into oral presentations. So when we do an oral presentation, the first slide is always like the title slide. And so let's see if I can go back to, I'm going to try something and I hope I can get back to 110. Okay. All right. So here, when I do my presentation, I have my title slide and then I have my agenda. And here with each part of the agenda, I go over what I'm going to cover. So this is similar to your thesis statement, three reasons. Okay. And so always, and then each one of these represents five slides, five slides for building blocks, five slides, five slides. You should try to keep it all even. So that way you, you, you look more even. Okay, so let's see if I can get back to wherever I was before. 
a hundred and roughly here. And so here, the dangers of vaping. So vaping causes, so the agenda would have vaping causes lung cancer, throat cancer, stomach cancer, you would have it as a bullet. And then you would have slide one, you would write about lung cancer. Slide two would be a throat cancer. Slide three would be about, um, yeah, the next cancer over. And then you would have your conclusion slide and your sources slide is last, just like with this one. And so we already went over our elevator speech, okay? Um, hi, I'm Jed White. I'm an arts technology tech specialist. I build computer programs that save museums a ton of money. Recently, for example, I showed uh, Archive House how to convert a lot of uh, work done by hand. Anyway, whatever. So this is an elevator, elevator speech. And here is a format business letter, okay, and another format business letter. Basically, you have the same thing as in an essay. You have the introduction, then you have one paragraph for your body paragraph, and then you have your conclusion, your call to action uh, paragraph. And I'm going to go over the proposal, but I'm not going to go over each and every part, okay? I'm just going to talk it out. So this is the last part I'm going to go over. Everything else I'm going to let you read. And so when we write a business proposal or a format, this is very similar to a problem solution paper in which the first part of the proposal, you state the problem. You state what the problem is. You state the context and the purpose of the problem. You state the evidence for, of the problem. And then the second, you, st you state your, your literature review. So you state what the problem is, who your audience, who the data, the feasibility, literature review. So all of this top part is you stating the problem of what's going on. Then methods, qualifications, work schedule, and call to action. This whole second part is how you're going to solve that problem. Okay. So the first half is all about what is the problem. And then the second half is well, how do I solve that problem? All right. So that is, this is the same structure that we do for research proposals, for science papers and for bis any kind of proposal, okay? So this is, this is a very common uh, uh, structure. Um, and so here, the purpose and scope, you define the problem, assumptions, predictions on what you already know about the problem, methods, what still needs research, the procedure of your research and sources of your research, limitations, the limitations of your study, data and evidence to support your main idea, your conclusion, call to action, references, and sources. And here you have another streamline, subject, object, problem, proposal, advantages, disadvantages, and here, action, and so, so here, a great way to remember um, your, your business proposal, SOPRADA, okay? SOPRADA is a great format for brief proposal, subject, objective, problem, proposal, advantages, disadvantages, action. And action is the one that, that's usually the uh, um, solution. Okay, that's, so, so Prada is a great way to remember the streamlined format of a business, um, business proposal. So what's So Prada again? Can you remember? Subject, object, problem, proposal, advantages, disadvantages, action. Did you already know this? No. No. Oh, no. Okay. So I will go over. This is that the. This will be the hardest thing you will write in. In because when I was teaching the business class, writing the business proposal, that the students had an entire semester to write their business proposal, and the assignment was you had to find a real company and then find a way to improve that company. You had to research it. Okay. And so everybody had to go around to some company and finding a problem they had to solve. And that was their, their, their uh, final, final exam assignment or, or something like that. So anyway, um, they don't teach that here. I don't know why, but they don't. So I'm trying to do it all in. So here's an example problem. So introduction. This report proposes the problem of table saw to increase production in our store fixture manuf... In other words, they want to manufacture more saws in order to increase pro profits. Okay. So this proposal will document the problem, examine the capabilities, detail the cost, and recommend the locations, the advantages and disadvantages, and present 
conclusions on how we can create more more saws, okay, for more profit. And so you could still have so prada. Subject would be creation of more saws. Objective, more profit. Problem, how are we going to go about creating all of these saws and still be under budget? And then proposal, well, that's what you're doing. The advantages is we're going to make a lot of money. Disadvantages, okay, how much money is it going to cost to do this? And then what action are we going to take? Okay, and so that's so, so, so prada. And then um, here in the first one, okay, let's see, where was I? Oh, okay, yeah. So here you would have the purpose and the scope. And so here's another example. This proposal is to purchase and install bicycle supports and gate locks at the elementary school. So that way the bicycles are all locked in, in the bicycle rack. So that's the purpose. The problem is uh, bikes were being stolen. I believe I had the problem, I don't remember. Anyway, the problem, which is missing, is that bikes were being stolen. So the purpose of this uh, is to purchase um, bike locks. The scope is that um, in this report, an examination of the problem, a tabulation of survey results, the description of the proposed concrete bicycle support and gate locks are presented, followed by the layout costs and conclusion. So that is the scope. And then here you would have uh, advantages and disadvantages. The advantages of having a uh, bike lock is you, you're going to cut down on all the bicycle theft. So this is Soprata. Basically, the, she, this person is, this is an example of Soprata. So here you have the problem of whatever it is, the objective. Then you have the purpose and the scope. And then you have um, the solution. So, so the first half is you present the problem. And then the second half is you present the solution. So it is a problem known as a, so if you want to Google it, Google problem solution paper. So your, pro, your solution to the problem becomes your proposal. As you propose a solution that will work, in the second half of your proposal, state your solutions to the problem. State the benefits of your solution. Eliminate other alternative solutions to convince your reader that your solution is the only solution. So you could say, well, company A thinks he could solve the problem this way, but that's not very good. Company B is too expensive. You want to hire me because I have the company C. And, and then you brainstorm um, the solution is you to hire that person. And so here you would have, this is another one, present the problem, the equipment, the capabilities, the cost, the personnel, and then the timetable. And so here you have the consequences the examples. Oh, here's another one. The problem is they want to have um, bigger, a bigger parking lot for the uh, business building. So that you present the problem as we have a big parking, we have a small parking lot and it's not enough uh, parking for all the clients and all the people. So we need to build a bigger parking lot. So that becomes, so the problem is too small a parking lot and then you want to convince the company to spend the money to build a bigger parking lot. And so here you have to present the problem. Okay, what is the what is the consequences? What are the example consequences? And then what is a call to action? So here, let me see. Oh, okay. So it starts with here. So you have the introduction, then you have uh, the scope, then you have your solution. So problem solution. Okay. Here's more of the solution. And then here you have the consequences. If you don't do it my way, okay, the consequences is disadvantages. If you don't follow my solution, you're going to end up with a lower, lower profit. You're going to end up with a very crowded uh, parking lot, and no one will have any place to, to park. You're going to have lower revenue. So that's the consequences of not doing my proposal. And so here are more example um, advantages and disadvantages. So a new parking lot will enhance the appearance of the property and raise property value. Disadvantage is temporary work interruptions. As, and so everyone, while they work on the parking lot, everyone's going to have to take a bus to another parking lot, but it's only going to be for two weeks because the end result is you're going to have a big, beautiful parking lot. So you have to tell them what the disadvantages are so that you, they know you're not lying and you're not glossing everything over. And then if, they, if they, 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 the group, the company thinks that the benefits outweigh the disadvantages, they will hire you to build that big parking lot. And then the last 
part of your proposal is the call to action. Always, you notice that the call to action is always the last part of any business communication, whether it be an email, whether it be a business letter, whether it be your letter of introduction, or whether it's your business proposal. Call to action means buy my product, hire me, I'm the best, uh, do, do business with me and not everybody else. So that would be a call to action. And then that's it for the proposal. So Soprata is a great way of remembering your, um, well, I don't remember, subject, object, purpose, um, advantages, disadvantages, action. So I, I more or less got, I think I missed one, but that's pretty much Soprata, call to action. So the last one is action. Did I go too fast? Is that good? Okay. And then this is about how to use visuals in a presentation. Now, if you're going to use visuals, um, you can use Adobe Spark. You can use Photor, you can use Photoshop, you can use Inkscape, you can use GIMP, um, Canva. Those are the ones that, oh, Photoshop Elements. Those are the, the um, that come off the top of my head. Canva is really good for infographs. That, those were fun to play with. Adobe Spark is more for like um, social media banners. Like if you're going to make a Facebook banner, if you're doing a website, Adobe Spark has a lot more design and has a lot more pictures. Canva has a lot fewer designs, a lot fewer templates, but they make great posters and great infographs. So that's Canva. And then if you want to make your photographs look beautiful or move around, uh, then you would want to use Photoshop Elements. And, and 3D, if you want to do something really fancy, that Photoshop Elements is the Anything Adobe is top of the heap, okay? Microsoft tries to, you know, they, they tried to came out with Visio, and Microsoft just not very good with visuals. It's always Adobe uh, for everything. Adobe and a Mac, a Macintosh. That's, that's for graphic design. And, but, you know, um, Microsoft is trying to, keep, to catch up, but Microsoft is mainly Microsoft products like Office, Excel, PowerPoint, and Visio and um, there's another one, to get off the access, are all mainly for um, business numbers and, and, and letters, not so much for vis visuals, because it, all you could do is insert picture, and, and if you want to make a visual that really pops out, and, and Microsoft has some templates, but it's so boring, Microsoft. You want to go Adobe. If you want to, if you want to, if you're going to do a training video, then you want to get a video editing uh, software like Camtasia or something like that, or Screencast-O-Matic if you want something free. So that's for video editing. If you're going to, and also Adobe um, Page and Adobe Video. So you can use free software programs, and then, then I, whatever I just said, I just this is what. Um, but Microsoft has decent graphs, you know, so you can make all kinds of graphs in Microsoft Word. So if you want to go fancy, you go Adobe and, and Canva. There's also Visme as well. Visme makes great graphics and Ven, Ven, Ven graphs. Um, anyway, and you could also use Google Slides too. Anyway, um, Google has a lot of stuff. And so writing tips for all business uh, documents is you got to be professional. Don't be stiff. Don't use a lot of jargon. Don't use a lot of hype and be concise, which is I'm not doing, being good at being concise in this, uh, whatchamacallit. So social media, oh, this is a third class. I used to teach social media and technology. That was fun. And so here, how do we use social media? And also this is mainly for millennials. The younger you get, um, baby boomers, eh, it's okay social media, but it's not, it's not their main cup of tea. And so if you want to be smart online, so if you're going to keep a professional online um, presence, you don't post pictures of yourself drunk at your college uh, party. That's what my, my niece did. She, when she was in college, she posted pictures of herself naked and drunk uh, on, on her online presence. Then when she graduated college, she wanted to get a job as a legal secretary. You think she got hired? No, she didn't get hired. She really wanted to be a legal secretary too, but then they saw her naked and drunk on her website. And then even though they, she deleted it, but they could still recover it somehow. So, so you want to be smart. Keep a professional online presence. Employers, look at your online presence to see what kind of character you have. 
Do not post pictures of, of yourself partying or drunk as this gives the employer the impression that you are not a serious person. And make sure you spell your words correctly, uh, even if you're online. And so here, uh, oh, and then of course, LinkedIn. Do you have a LinkedIn profile? No. You should, do, you should, you should get a LinkedIn because when you make a LinkedIn page, that's how the uh, recruiters know that you're serious. And so LinkedIn is a great networking uh, social uh, 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 website. So maintain it, uh, make a online presence in LinkedIn. So you can create an online portfolio of all your work. You can list samples of your work, such as videos, posters, or other things. You can list your experience and awards. You can show employers your references, and you can tell fun stories about your workplace. So you should go to LinkedIn and take a look at other people's uh, LinkedIn profiles, and you'll see what I'm talking about. I remember I would. I remember one time I made my LinkedIn profile because one of the schools wanted. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, we can't hire you. That was what the HR person said. So it was for that school that I made that my first LinkedIn um, profile. So you could t take a look at this. And so here, uh, here's some. Um, if you want to describe yourself in three sentences, just like with the uh, elevator pitch, so you would say. Um, Yvonne Ho, business writing, magazine features, writing workshops, publication projects. So that's kind of like your tagline that's, and th that comes after your name. And after your tagline, then you have three or four sentences like an elevator pitch of who you are. And then you have, after that, then you have all of your, a list, like your, a resume of everything that you did. And then you can upload your, your, if you're an art major, all your paintings. You can upload your, and your good evalu teacher evaluations, or oh, you're not a teacher, nurse evaluations, and, and that sort of thing. So that's basically what, what you can do. And then here are some examples of someone's, um, you know, uh, I'm a public relations professional with a great background in the entertainment industry. My special love is hip-hop culture. I'm looking to connect my two passions. Or you can write a story. When I realized how terrified most people are of sitting in a dentist chair, I decided to find ways to make the experience more positive, something people would look forward to. So I would make a great dentist. So you have to write, after you write your, I'm a great teacher, um, I'm a public publicist, then you have to write your elevator pitch. Okay, so you should keep an on, online, and if you're willing to pay $30 a month to LinkedIn, LinkedIn has so many great classes. It could teach you how to use software, they teach you how to do an elevator pitch, they teach you what to do in, in, an, in a LinkedIn, uh, in an interview, everything so if I had the thirty dollars a month I would and all of the all of the you can take as many classes as you want you can earn certificates so if you're willing to pay LinkedIn thirty dollars a month then they provide great business you can even learn Python that is the, that's a uh, computer for co computer coding and then for free you can write LinkedIn articles and then everybody can see how knowledgeable you are in your field okay so if you then when when you write your resume you can you can uh, tell on your resume published articles and you can write in a list of all your LinkedIn articles okay so that makes you look knowledgeable so like Facebook you can join oh did I skip something no okay LinkedIn so that's that's LinkedIn and you have to know how to explain your value on LinkedIn you advertise your strengths to future employers you network with other professionals. You write stories about your success, and you use concrete numbers to show how you added to the success of your company. I I had 75. I added 75 percent more profit to company X or something like that. So the more numbers and, and you can back that up, the better. So that's that's a LinkedIn. On Facebook. I actually created just for fun a business page. So, so Facebook, you can actually there's Facebook Marketplace in which you can sell things. So some people actually have businesses on Facebook. Okay, so um, I I just did it for fun. Twitter is where you can um, if you're on Twitter, just like with other social media, be careful of what you tweet. Make sure that your tweet is professional. 
The main objective on Twitter is to be retweeted because that's how you grow your audience. That's how you know your niche. And I use tweet Twitter just to read a whole bunch of magazines because you can gather all your magazines in one list. And then when you give your Twitter account uh, a link to your boss, to a potential boss, they can see all the different stuff that you read and then they think that you're very, very knowledgeable. So I use Twitter as a kind of repository of all the stuff that, research stuff that I read. So you can use Twitter to keep up with the latest trend and avoid tweeting when angry. And then of course you can have TikTok and if you're older and you don't know what TikTok or any social app is, you can ask your kids, your nieces and nephews, or your grandchildren. So if you're going to be dealing with younger and younger people, or younger, once again, you've got to know how old your boss is. And so if you're going to be dealing with a very young boss, then you should get to know your social apps really well. So that way you can talk like the boss, sound like the boss. And they won't think, especially if you look old, you, they won't think you're a dinosaur. You have no advantages to say, I was raised in the pre-internet age. They just think you're a dinosaur. They just, that's actually in a, a uh, disadvantage. And then um, ethos, pathos, and logos, I'm not going to go over here, but I'm going to go over this really, really well uh, in um, week nine forum, where I'm going to go over how you can write a really good persuasive argument. But you got to have ethos, pathos, and logos. And here, all of this, I am going to go over in your, uh, all the persuasive stuff anyway, next time. So when you create your own website, have you ever created your own website? So this is how you would create your own website. You can go to Weebly or Wix, or you can go to GoDaddy or WordPress. And then this is the structure of a, you know, your um, website. You would have a home page that has a, con that, that's a concise magnetic, you know, message. In other words, your home page is where everything is located. Just like on uh, my Canvas home, classroom homepage, I put everything there. Then an About Us page, that's your letter of introduction. So that establishes your credentials. A Services page, in other words, what are you going to do for the customer, how it works. So that explains how you navigate through your website. Case studies, all well, those are the testimonials. I bought this product. Or Professor H, she was a great teacher too. In my case, it's testimonials of students. That's case study. A contact page is like at the very end. Where if you're interested in hiring, hiring, that's a call to action. If you're interested in hiring me, email me. And we can schedule an interview. That's contact page. And a blog. Do you have a blog? Now, WordPress is the best of the bloggers. I have mine on blogger.com, but you can write articles about anything and it shows off your expertise in your field. Now either you can either create a separate blog like I did, or you can create the blog inside your website as part of your online portfolio. And so I found that it was a lot of fun to create my online portfolio, which I think I might have put inside my classroom. I don't know if I, I don't remember if I did. And then the last section I think is uh, the last two sections are on resume and, um, in and interviews tips. And so here you have um, match your job, match your history. When you write a resume, do you already know that you're supposed to match your uh, resume? In other words, if the description says, I want a team player, then you're going to write on your resume, I'm a team player because, and you, you, would, elong, you would delete everything else and team player becomes a large part of your, so match your history with the job that you want, okay, as much as you can. Showcase your accomplishments. So let's say she says they want teamwork, so you would showcase your accomplishments in relation to teamwork. So that way, you've got to show that you were born for that job, and only that job. So don't just simply make a list, a general list of all your accomplishments. Use action verbs to prove what you've accomplished launched, streamlined, origin, originated, chaired, generated, instituted, rejuvenated, mobilized, originated, um, revamped. There are hundreds of high energy verbs you can choose from by Googling action verbs. Okay, They've even broken it down by industry. So build with action verbs to show how you've made a difference in the jobs you've held rather than being someone who just fills a role passively. Avoid phrases that start with responsible for, duties include, 
Go for accomplishments and facts. Manage purchasing for office can be better stated as systemize de departmental buying and save 3% of total budget. Okay, of course, tell only the truth. Okay, so, so when you are more, the more action, the better. Okay, so that's, that's, um, and then communi communicating right in a confident, positive tone. Do not focus on what you cannot do. Always have a can-do attitude. Show the future employer you are a problem solver and always have a, a positive attitude. As for interview tips, okay, this is a great book. What color is your parachute? Okay, in what color is your parachute? The author guides you in deciding what life goals you want to achieve. What kind of job do you want? What kind of company do you want to work for? Exactly what field do you want to get into? What is your life purpose? How do you find your dream job? All of that is all answered in what color is your parachute. Here's some examples of what color is your parachute. The greatest mistakes made in job interviews. Going after large organizations only. Fortune 500, okay? Hunting all by yourself for places to visit. In other words, if you just go to the office and you do no research, okay, that's a big no-no. If you go there and, and, and you let the interviewer dominate the, the conversation and you just passively sit there like this, like you show no interest, then that is a, a big mistake. You have to show that you're proactive, that you know what the weaknesses or the strengths of the company is because that shows to the interviewer you took the trouble to research the company and so you have to be the problem solver the person that's going to solve whatever the problems so that that in other words you probably have to talk to an insider that's a hard that's a hard part that's called networking uh, of what problems might exist in the company and then you find a way in your interview to solve those problems and so you let your uh, and you don't let your resume be the only agenda discussed during the job interview. Talking primarily about yourself uh, and what benefits, and if you just talk about this job is good for me because no, it's got to be how will I benefit the company? And so you can't go there and beg for a job because that also looks bad. And right after the interview, you have to have a thank you note. So here, you, these are the greatest mistakes. So it's a, it's a great book. Um, I. I, I, and oh, yeah, I remember I filled out a big flower thing in which you, 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 you de define who you are and what kind of company you wanted you want. And that's how I ended up at Fortis College after I filled out the, um, the what color is your parachute. Um, anyway, so here is your references page. Okay, This is the very last page when you do a oral presentation. This means that I, this is the longest, I, I warned you in the very beginning, this was going to be a long lecture. And none of my lectures are going to be this long. This is the longest lecture you will ever get from me. Okay, so so this is the longest lecture, and I got most of this from business uh, business writing for dummies. And if you click on the link, um, let's see, I'll send I'll send everybody the the uh, the PowerPoint. If you click on the link, it goes directly to the book, and then here uh, this is just a link to where you can buy the book. And I think that this is a link that in which you get to the book. Okay, so I, I forget, but I use one, two, three, four, five sources for such a large, um, large, uh, what should I call it? Um, and this is represents about three classes that I would teach at another school, and each class would be what sixteen weeks: business etiquette, uh, business and culture, business writing, roughly something like that. And so, um, and I, I got I usually taught the business writing one. Um, but uh, because I was considered the English teacher. So I got all the mainly business writing. Other people got business etiquette. So if you're a communications major, they got most of the uh, um, communication uh, classes. So um, do you have any questions? No? Okay. No so, questions. On the quiz, grammar concepts? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I couldn't find it. I don't know. If, was it sent in an announcement or is it just what we've already gone over in the past or? Oh, okay. If, if, um, I don't remember if I, if I even sent it, that's, that's a, that's a good one. I might've forgotten to send the week seven quiz. It's in the um, modules yeah. on Canvas. I just finished it before your class. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I'll find it. 
Yeah. I just didn't know if it was sent it like an announcement. Sometimes it's sent an announcement, so it's you know like an easy find. But no worries, I'll just go into the module. Yeah, it's on week seven module. It's the last one. Yeah, and also I um I think I you you can also look at the PowerPoint that I sent. That's also on the home page. You can also I I made a PowerPoint of it, although you can't download it. But I did forget to. I guess I forgot. No, it's okay. I just you know was looking for it, and I mean I can I can do some digging. It's okay. Oh, okay. All right. So, and also the lecture notes are on the home page as well. So, do you have any other questions? No. No. That's it. This is too long, so everybody can't wait to go home. And so, uh, did you did you like it? Was it was it okay? It was good. Very very informative. Very yes. informative. Okay. All right. All right. So I'll see you guys next week. Okay. See you next week. See you next week.